Okay, we're gonna go through 10 questions that are gonna help you to boost your SAT math score. So let's jump into the first question. Which of the following is equal to x to the four-fifths power? And we've got some multiple choice options here. So what do you think? Is it A, the fourth root of x to the fifth? Is it B, the square root of x to the fifth? Is it C, the fifth root of x to the fourth? Or D, is it the square root of x to the four-fifths? So go ahead and pause the video, see if you can do this problem on your own. And of course, we'll go through it together. The thing that they're testing us on in this particular problem is that we know our rational exponents, basically fractional exponents. And the key here is, is that the denominator is the root or the index, and the numerator is the power. And the thing is, they can put that power here or they can put it on the outside. So they could say, this is the fifth root of x, to the fourth like that, either one. But if you can remember, the numerator is the power, denominator is the root, you've got it. So it looks like it's gonna be this one right here, letter C. Okay, number two, see if you can do this one on your own. It says the function G is defined by a polynomial. Which of the following must be a factor of G of X? And they give us some points here on the polynomial. So what do you think for this one is the uh, factor of g of x, x minus two, is it x minus six, is it x plus one, or is it x minus one? So what they're really testing us on here is the connection between zeros and factors. And when I talk about what a zero is and what a factor is, let's just see if we can plot these points just so I can demonstrate. So negative one, four is right there. Zero, two is right there. Uh, three, negative one is right here, and six, zero is right there. So we have this you know, polynomial going through these points. Polynomial is like a nice smooth curve, continuous, right? But when you talk about the zeros, what that means is that the y coordinate is a zero. So see, for example, here how this is a six comma zero, you're not going up or down, that y value is zero. That tells us that six is a zero and that x minus six is a factor. So you wanna remember that x minus whatever the zero is, is a factor. So if it was a negative number, it'd be x minus a negative number, those two negatives would cancel, give you a positive. So it looks like for this one, uh, letter B would your, be your best answer. Okay, number three, see if you can pause the video and do this one on your own. It says, given that the line y equals mx plus seven, where m is a constant and contains the point r comma t, where r does not equal zero and t does not equal zero, what is the slope of the line in terms of r and t? Okay, so they're testing us on a lot of different concepts in this problem. One is that you know your y equals mx plus b form of the equation of a line. Remember the slope intercept form of the line. And remember the b is the y intercept, the m is the slope. And when you have a point that lies on the line, what that means is that if you were to plug in those x and y coordinates, it's gonna make the equation true. So let's go ahead and do that. So here you can see t is our y value. So we have t equals m times r, which is our x value, uh, plus seven. Now the other thing they're testing us on is this language that you wanna be familiar with in terms of. What does in terms of mean? Well, we wanna get the slope, which is our m value, in terms of r and t, meaning we, we wanna get the m by itself. We wanna get everything else on the other side of the equation only containing r's, t's, and constants. In this case, seven is a constant. So how do we get this m by itself? Well, we think about working from the outside in. So I would subtract seven from both sides of the equation to keep it balanced, right? And then we wanna get m by itself, so what's the opposite of multiplying by r? Divide by r, and now you can see that m equals t minus seven divided by r, which looks like letter d, and you got it. Okay, number four, see if you can do this one on your own. 2x minus ay equals 12, 6x minus 9y equals 36. In the system of equations above, a is a constant and x and y are variables. For what value of a will the system have infinite solutions? And we've got, would a be three, would uh, a be four, would a be negative three, or would a be nine? What do you think? See if you can pause the video and do this one. The thing that they're testing us on here are basically systems of equations with lines, and we're trying to figure out, do they cross at like one point? Are they parallel? Do they cross at no points? Or are they the exact same line, meaning that they're crossing at <clears throat> an infinite number of points? Well, if they have different slopes, meaning they're going up at different angles, they're gonna cross at one point. 
if they have the same slope but a different y-intercept, then they're going to be parallel. There's going to be no solution. But again, if they're the same line, meaning they have the same slope and the same y-intercept, then there's going to be an infinite number of solutions. Now, again, like I said, if they're infinite number of solutions, that means that they're the same line, right? So when you look at these uh, equations here, you can always multiply an equation by a constant, and it'll be the same line. As long as you do it to everything in the equation, left and right sides, you keep it balanced, right? So what I notice here is that if I multiply this top equation by three, you know, and I distribute that three to everything in the equation here, that's gonna give us six x minus three ay equals 36. So let's just go ahead and write that down. So I'll put it right <clears throat> underneath here. Six x minus three ay equals 36. So you can see that these equations are gonna be exactly the same as long as this negative 3a is equal to this negative 9, right? So all we have to do is make a simple equation here. Negative 3a is equal to negative 9. Divide both sides by negative 3. And you can see that a is equal to positive 3, which is letter a, and you got it. Okay, number 5. See if you can do this one on your own. y equals k times x minus 3 times x minus 7. In the equation above, k is a non-zero constant. The graph of the equation in the xy plane is a parabola with vertex l comma m. Which of the following is equal to m? Okay, that's an interesting question. So when they tell us it's a parabola, we know it has this kind of u-type shape. And we're looking for that vertex, that point where the graph bends. And that's our vertex right there at l comma m. Now, what they're testing us on in this problem is that we know our different forms of the equation of a parabola. And let me just write down those forms here for you. It's going to be y equals our, like our general form, ax squared plus bx plus c. There's our vertex form, which is a times the quantity x minus h squared plus k. And then there's what's called our intercept form. I'll just call this a times x minus p, x minus q. It's like a factored form. Now, you can see that they're giving it to us in this third form here, this intercept form. And what that means is that if we were to set these factors, these groups, equal to zero, we can find the x-intercepts. So by setting x minus 3 equal to zero, you can see that we get x equals 3. And if we set x minus 7 equal to zero, you can see that we get x equals 7. So let's just draw like a kind of a rough sketch here. We know that the graph is going to cross here at 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So the graph might be opening up, it might be opening down. But one thing you'll notice about these parabolas is that they have an axis of symmetry, meaning if you fold it over that line that goes through the vertex, it's going to match up with itself, right? So you, all we have to do is find this halfway point, which is going to be right here at 5. Another way of finding the halfway point is to add these two numbers together. 3 plus 7 is 10, and divide by 2, that's also 5. So we know that the axis of symmetry is x equals 5. It's also going to be the x-coordinate of the vertex. So we know that, L, um, that 5 is the x-coordinate of the vertex. So if we put 5 in for x, right, uh, let's go ahead and do that. We have y equals k times 5 minus 3, which is 2, 5 minus 7, which is negative 2. Now we can simplify a little bit down further. This is uh, negative uh, 4 k and we know that our y coordinate of our vertex is um, is m right and it says which of the following is equal to m so I'm just going to put m here this since this is our our uh, y coordinate of our vertex and we want to solve for uh, m so which one is equal to m that's going to be negative 4 k which you can see here is letter C and you got it so if you're enjoying this video so far and you want to learn more about how to really do well on the math section of the SAT, check out my huge SAT math review video course where I go through 39 important concepts that you're going to want to know to really do well on the math portion of the SAT. So check it out and we'll continue on with this video. We've got four more uh, questions. So let's go to number six. Okay, number six, see if you can do this one on your own. Given the formula for the volume of a sphere, which is V equals four thirds pi r cubed, which of the following gives r in terms of v? So we saw this language earlier uh, in this video in a different problem, but here we're specifically just focusing on rewriting this formula such that you're getting r in terms of v. So is it a, b, c, or d? See if you can do this one on your own. If I was gonna do it, what I would do is I would think about working from the outside in. 
towards that R, okay? So in order to get rid of this 4 thirds, okay, I would multiply both sides of the equation by 3 fourths. Now you can think of V as like V over 1, because anything divided by 1 is itself. And so you can, now you have 3V over 4 equals pi R cubed. We're still working from the outside in towards that R. How do we get rid of the pi? Well, instead of multiplying by pi, we can divide by pi. Or you can think about multiplying by the reciprocal. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 1 over pi. The pi's cancel. Now we have R cubed equals 3V over 4 pi. We want to get rid of the cube. The opposite of the cubing something is to take the cube root. So if we take the cube root of both sides, now you can see that R equals this quantity here, which looks like uh, letter D, and you got it. Okay, number seven, see if you can do this one on your own. It says the surface area of a human's lungs is equal to half of a tennis court, which is about 2,100 square feet. How many square feet would the lungs of a 30-person baseball team cover? Okay, kind of a bizarre story problem, but what they're testing us on here is proportions, okay? And so what you wanna do here is you wanna basically realize that half of a tennis court would be about 1,050 uh, feet squared. So that's per one adult's lungs. So I'll say one pair of lungs, okay? But we wanna find out what the area would be for a 30-person uh, baseball team. So we're now we're talking about 30 pairs of lungs, okay? And so now all we have to do is, when you do a proportion, you make sure you've got like the area to the number of lungs, area to the number of lungs. You don't wanna switch those uh, around. You wanna keep them in the same order. So if it's like square feet per uh, lungs, square feet per lungs, then all you have to do is cross multiply on the diagonal to solve this proportion. So you can see A times one is A, 30 times 1,050 is 31,500, and that's gonna be the best answer for this one. So proportions is an important concept to know uh, on the SAT. Okay, number eight, see if you can do this one. If two minus three i divided by four plus five i is rewritten in a plus b i form, what is the value of b? Is it 22 ninths, is it nine twenty seconds, is it negative 22 over 41, or is it seven over 41? So what do you think for that one? Well, the key here with this problem is you want to get rid of the i in the denominator. That's considered you know, improper. And because this is a binomial, see two terms, what you want to do is you want to multiply by the complex conjugate. So what you do is you change the sign to the opposite. So if this is minus, this would be plus. Of course, whatever you multiply the denominator by, you want to multiply the numerator by, because that's like multiplying by one, since these would cancel out. So now what we have to do is we just have to Multiply the numerators together, multiply the denominators together, and we have a binomial times a binomial. We can FOIL or distribute twice. So let's go ahead and do that. So we've got two times four, which is eight. Two times negative five i is negative 10 i. Okay, and if we distribute the negative three i, now we get negative 12 i and plus 15 i squared. Okay, all divided by four times four, which is 16. Four times negative five i is negative 20 i. 5i times 4 is positive 20i. Notice those cancel. And 5i times negative 5i is negative 25i squared. Now remember, what does i equal? It represents the square root of negative 1. What does i squared equal? It's negative 1. So a couple things you might want to memorize here if you don't know already. But you can see if we put in a negative 1 for i squared here, a negative 1 times negative 25 is positive 25, plus the 16 gives us 41. And over here, i squared is negative 1 times 15 is negative 15, plus 8 is negative 7, minus 22i. I'm just combining those, treating them like, uh, like terms. So now what you can do is you can divide this by 41, this by 41. So I'm just splitting it up into two fractions, okay? So we have the real part, the a, and the imaginary part, the bi part, separated. So it's in the standard a plus bi form. Now it wants to know what is b. And you can see B is this part here in front of the I. That's negative 22 over 41. So letter C would be your best answer for that one. Okay, number nine. See if you can do this one. So it says, which of the following is an equivalent form of the equation of the graph for which the coordinates of the vertex point B can be identified as constants in the equation? So constants are just like numbers, not variables. So we talked about this in a 
another question in this video, and it's really testing you on, you know, do you know your forms of your quadratic or your uh, parabola? You've got like our general form, that's this one here. We've got our vertex form, that's the second one. And we have our intercept form, that's this third one here. And so which one do you think it is? Is it A, B, C, or D? Well, you can see that letter D and letter C, these are like in the general form. So that rules those out. Uh, letter B is in the intercept form, meaning if you set these factors equal to zero, you're gonna get the x-intercepts, like zero and negative four. So that rules that one out, that's focusing on the intercepts. It has to be letter A, this is our vertex, negative two, negative four. So we're going left two, down four. Remember the number that's uh, grouped with the x has the opposite effect. So the plus two is actually shifting left two. This has the same effect, down four. So as far as focusing on the um, vertex in terms of the uh, constants in the equation, that would be letter A would be your best answer. Okay, number 10, see if you can do this problem on your own. It says the equation C equals 10H plus 20 is used to find the cost C of renting a boat for each hours. What does the 20 represent in the equation? Uh, is it letter A, how much it costs to rent the boat for one hour? Or is it B, the total cost of renting the boat? Or is it C, the starting cost to rent the boat? Or is it D, how many boats are available to rent? So what do you think for that one? Well, what they're testing us on in this equation, uh, in, sorry, in this problem here is the y equals mx plus b form of the equation of a line. And remember that the m is the slope, the b is the y-intercept, but in a story problem or a word problem, the slope, you can think of that as the rate and the B, this is like the initial condition or the starting amount. So in this particular problem, uh, the 20 would represent the starting amount, the 10 would represent the rate, meaning like the cost per hour. And you can test this out. If you put one in for H, one hour, then you can see the price is gonna be 30. If you put zero hours, it's gonna be 20. So you can see it's going up by $10 every hour. C, of course, represents the total cost, depending after however many hours that you rent the boat for. So it looks like the best answer here is gonna be a letter C, which is the starting cost to rent the boat. And you got it. So if you're enjoying this video and you want more SAT math practice, of course, uh, check out my course for sale. But you can also take a look at the videos I did over there in that playlist going over some additional SAT practice. I'll see you over in those videos. I'll talk to you then.